This sermon will be the first in a two-part sermon. This second part will be this afternoon, the Lord willing. I hope in this sermon to teach and all of us understand better what the Bible teaches about deity, the divine essence. But in the process of doing so, I hope that we will, and that will be dealt with much this afternoon, know the difference in Muslims, Allah, and in the God of the Bible, the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I hope that we accomplish several things, those are at least a couple of them, and uh, you may get more because I have found that a great many of us just haven't done a lot of serious study on the nature of the Godhead. When I used to teach classes on this in preacher training school, I'd always say one of the things you will come out of this class knowing is how much you don't know and that there's some things you'll never figure out because your finite mind was not meant to do so. But you can certainly learn a whole lot more than what most of us do about uh, the great I am. So I'm calling this study the concept of God in Islam and Christianity. And I'm thinking of Christianity from the standpoint of how it would be defined by the New Testament of the Christ. The word Christian means of Christ. Without Christ, there is no of Christ. There is no Christianity without Christ. And when I speak of Christianity, I mean those composing the church that Jesus built and purchased with his own blood. Matthew 16, 18 and Acts 20, 28. Of uh, which he is the head, Colossians 1.18, and to which he adds all those he saves when they're baptized into Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27, and Acts 2.47. So in this study, we're investigating whether the Christian or Muslim concept of God is true. And in the process, we must then learn something of what the Bible teaches about God. So does the Bible or the Quran reveal the truth? about deity but I must pause say however since we are and have been for some time li living in a very secular world but even in religion in a monk's religious relativism which teaches that all religions are supposed to be equally right then to even ask if either the Christian or Muslim God is true is politically incorrect to the nth degree Thus, in the thinking of many, such a study is a waste of time. And I can understand that if you think that it doesn't religion make any difference, regardless of the religion, then uh, I can see why you would think this would be ridiculous. But I will state in the beginning that religious relativism, regardless of how many people believe it or not, is simply not true. It's false. It's logically disjointed. And putting all that together, it just cannot be true. But I may ask, for sake of study, why is this the case? Because the world's religions conceive of God or God's, lowercase g, in many, many contradictory ways. And this means that they cannot all be true. Islam, and we should point this out at the beginning, and Christianity, remember how I defined that, concept of deity is so different that both religions cannot be right or correct. These two religions, respectively, have different doctrines or teachings concerning what God is like. For example, the Bible teaches that God is tripersonal, that there are in the one God, and by that we mean the one divine essence, three persons that the Bible reveals as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But Muslims categorically deny this doctrine. They believe that God is a single person. Therefore, Christians and Muslims cannot both be right. Uh, of course, we could both be wrong, 
It could be that the Buddhists are correct and God is impersonal. But the Bible and the Quran cannot both be correct. So in this study, part of our work in, in engaging in it is evaluating the competing claims of Islam and what the Bible teaches by assessing their different concepts of God. Now as we begin, we first will example the will examine the principal Islamic assessment of the Bible's teaching about God. And second, which I think we'll get into this afternoon, to examine very judiciously the Muslim concept of God with a view toward determining its sufficiency. Now we want to study the biblical concept of God and in so studying it, ask why Muslims find it rationally objectionable. The Bible teaches of God that he is an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-holy, eternal spiritual being who created the universe. Well, you know, Muslims agree with all these attributes or properties of God. In fact, if you get online and you begin to read material concerning the creation, Muslims have some very good material in there regarding creation and the opposition to evolution. So no religion is absolutely, totally, and completely wrong on every single solitary point. We understand that. But that's not what we're dealing with in this study. Remember, we're talking about the concept of God in Islam and Christianity, and we're now looking at what the Bible teaches about God. So when you talk about these divine attributes of God that I just mentioned, uh, Muslims will agree with these attributes, or we might call them uh, spiritual qualities of God or properties. And this should not surprise anyone since Islam is to some extent historically, now understand that, to some extent historically speaking, connected to Jews and Christians. So their understanding of what God is like is in some respects the same. I'm drive down a peg right here and deviate just for a moment. If you were to have lived from the late first century all the way up until, say, the early 400s, you would have seen the church throughout the whole world, wherever it was, all split up. All sorts of apostasies had been going on for many, many years. You might approach this congregation and they might tell you one, two, three, four, five is what is characteristic of Christians. You might go over 100 miles and come to another congregation and they might tell you one, two, three, four, five is essential and that's the same as the other one, but then they add five, six, seven, and eight, which is different from what the other one, and you had that throughout the empire. The church had already fallen away as far as its scriptural organization. You already had a bishop over a whole city no matter how many congregations were in that city, he was the metropolitan bishop, and thus the elders of each church would be responsible to him. So all of that kind of thing had already been taking place. In fact, by 150 A.D., you already had among the elders one man who was held up as with more authority than the other elders. He eventually became known as the bishop, and finally he became the metropolitan bishop over a whole metropolitan area, over all the congregations within it, and that's still seen today in the organization of Roman Catholicism because Roman Catholics came out, that church came out of that apostasy and formed out of that apostasy. And it was a desperate effort starting in the 400s in time of Constantine to bring about some sort of unity as to really what, it, what, what are the cardinal doctrines of Christianity. Seemingly never dawning on them as it does it today to go back to the New Testament of Jesus Christ and learn it. So they came up first of all in 425 with the Nicene Creed and on and on and on it goes, finally turning to full-fledged Roman Catholicism 200 years later about with the Pope in Rome being the one to whom everybody had to say is more important than all the rest of the bishops. 
Now that's just a sideline. But I want you to keep in mind, that's what Muhammad sees and calls Christianity. That must be understood. And if you were a secularist person with no background at all in any religion pertaining to Christianity today, that's what you would see in all of the denominationalism that exists. No wonder the Lord prayed that we all would be one, even as he and his father are one, that the world may believe that thou sent me. And Paul scathingly rebuked in no uncertain terms the first beginnings of division within the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 1.10. Now with that being said, the major objection lodged by Islam against the Christian concept of God concerns the Trinity. One singular divine essence. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. But with three personalities. You are one person with one personality. That's the human nature. God is one person with three personalities. You can study the Bible from one end to the other, rightly dividing the word of truth on deity, and that's what you'll come up with. The Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and shares the same divine nature with God the Father. But Muslims oppose this doctrine because they believe that it commits the sin that they call, here's something you might remember, shirk. S-H-I-R-K, which is the sin of associating anything with God. They believe that God is incomparable or without peer. He cannot therefore have a son, as the Bible clearly teaches that he does. So the Quran condemns anyone who believes that God has a son and calls them an unbeliever and consigns that person to the fires of torment for teaching such a thing. Listen to what it says. In Surah, which means chapter 5 and verse 73, they are unbelievers who say God is the Messiah, Mary's son. Surely, whoever associates anything with God God shall prohibit him entrance to paradise and his home shall be in fire. None shall help the evildoers. Well, it may be that the Quran's opposition to the Trinity, I say it may be because as I described to you the state of so-called Christianity in an apostate state at the time that Muhammad was beginning to do what he did. It's based then on early apostate churches creeds human creeds and many of them were owed of Mary as the mother of God and you can still hear that today and of course they were trying to say Mary is the mother of Jesus but they weren't speaking as the oracles of God and they are not today when they talk about Mary being the mother of God Mary did not give birth to the divine nature of Christ thus it may be that the Quran is attacking a perverted description of how the Word became flesh. John 1 verse 14. Mary, the mother of our Lord, gave the second person of the Godhead his human nature. Thus, he's the son of God. And he's the son of man. And he referred to himself more as the son of man did the son of God. Well, that doesn't take away from the fact he's the son of God. It just meant he wants man to understand that he was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. He is our mediator. He ever liveth to make intercession for us. He knows what it's like to be a human being. He knows everything that troubled you troubled him. And yet he overcame it. Remember, I overcame the world. But Muhammad, in his profound ignorance of what the Bible actually taught, about God and especially about Jesus Christ evidently thought that Christians believed in a trinity and here's the way they thought of it a trinity of God the Father Mary and their offspring Jesus and Muhammad's misunderstanding of the trinity is evident in certain passages of the Quran and I want to notice some of them now 
God will say, Jesus, Son of Mary, did you ever say to mankind, worship me and my Father as gods besides God? And when he says gods, it's a lowercase and uppercase for God. Worship me and my Father as gods, lowercase, besides God, uppercase. Glory be to you, he will answer, I could never have claimed what I have no right to. Sort of 5, 117. The creator of the heavens and the earth, how should he have a son, seeing that he has no consort, and he created all things? Sort of 6, 102. Now, if we can't go to what the man wrote of the thoughts on his mind about certain things, which are found in the Quran, to learn what he really believed, I'd like to know where we're going to go. The false doctrine that Muhammad rejected specifically, that God the Father should consort with a human female to sire a son, and these three should then be worshipped as gods, let it be clearly understood, is nowhere taught in the Bible. If that's what a Muslim believes that the Bible teaches, then that Muslim doesn't know what the Bible teaches, at least about that point. According to the Bible, according to the infallible, inerrant, all sufficient final revelation of God to man, Jesus is called God's Son because he had no human father, but was miraculously conceived of a virgin. In the gospel according to Luke, the angel said this to Mary, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Luke 1.35 Now what makes this tremendously ironic is that the Quran affirms the virgin birth of Jesus. In the Quran's account, here's what they have the angel say. I am but a messenger of your Lord and have come to give you a holy son. Mary answers, how shall I bear a son when I have neither been touched by any man nor ever been unchaste? Well, the angel replies, Thus did your Lord speak. That is easy enough for me. Our decree shall come to pass. Surah 19, 20, and 22. Whereupon Mary conceives Jesus. No Muslim, therefore, should object to calling Jesus God's son in the sense of his being miraculously conceived. Now, here's what you run into. It's typical among the denominations, the human churches of men regarding the Bible. They don't know what their own book teaches. No wonder concerning Israel of old, and it speaks of spiritual Israel today, and it speaks of Muslims being what the Quran says they ought to be, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So it helps, you know, even to study their own book. They might learn something from the Quran that would help them be more open to the teaching of the Bible. So if the doctrine of the Trinity is not the character to rightly rejected by Muhammad, then we've got to ask, well, what is it? It is the doctrine that God is tri-personal. It is not the self-contradictory assertion that three gods are one God, nor again that three persons are one person. That's just theological nonsense. Rather, it is the claim that one entity we call God, the one divine essence, comprises three persons. That's no more illogical than saying that one geometrical figure we call a triangle is comprised of three angles. Three angles in one figure. Three persons in one being. It, it just goes along. Think about it. If you and, and of course the triangle doesn't perfectly illustrate God. We're not trying to say that. But you have one single solitary triangle. How many sides you have? One. No, well, the nature 
nature, I say, of the triangle. It's got three sides. And if it didn't have three sides, there wouldn't be one triangle. God exists in three persons. Blessed Trinity, as the song sounds. Perhaps the best way to think of this is to say that in God, there are three centers of self-consciousness. Now, I'm a being with a single center of self-consciousness and do well to stay conscious with one single center. <laughs> but we're not talking about man when we talk about God. We should never, and the Bible tells us this, think of God as a man. Each of these three persons is equal in glory and divine attributes. But we call him Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we do this because of the different roles they play in relation to us. The Father in the Scriptures is always revealed as He as, as the one that has all authority and hearing in Him. Remember, Jesus said, All authority hath been given unto me. Well, He had to get it from somebody. Somebody gave Him something. So the Father is always pictured as all authority and hearing in Him. Jesus has been given all authority until the end of time, and then that's when he says, according to Paul's writing to the Corinthians, that he'll lay down all rule and all authority. That's going to be an interesting situation. Why don't you obey the gospel and get ready to see it? See, sometimes we talk about these things, and I inject that there, like we're talking about Star Wars. Wonderful picture, but it never can happen. <laughs> so, the Father is the person who sends the Son to earth. It wasn't the Father's role to come to earth. It was the second person who is the executor of the Father's will. That was his role to come to earth and tabernacle in the flesh as a man. So the Son is the person who takes a human nature and becomes incarnate as Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, is the person who reveals God and confirms that truth that declares God by miracles, signs, and wonders. Miracles and signs and wonders to whom? To us, because we can't do things beyond the natural order of things. And a lot of those we can't do. It's not just anybody can go out and split an atom. But, but man did. But we're not talking about that kind of thing. So the Holy Spirit reveals the mind of God. Because He is God. He knows the mind of God. Why? He is God. And he proves it's the word of God, not the word of men, by miracle signs and wonders. They're signs to us. They make us wonder. The miraculous because they set aside natural law. People raised the dead. People never, never walked. Walk immediately. And so on. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, John writes. These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that believing you might have life through his name, John 20, 30, and 31. Now, notice uh, this argument, not original with me, but as I put these things together, I uh, found this to be quite compelling, although I worked it over myself. Noticing this argument, we see, by definition, God is the greatest conceivable being. Now, stop and think about that a minute. Note that word, think. Think about it a minute. God is the greatest conceivable being. Now, if you can think of a greater conceivable being, that would be God. There's no greater conceivable being than God because that's what God is. If you could conceive anything greater than God, I say again, then that would be God. Now, every Muslim who dies with the cry, Allahu Akbar, on his lips, agrees with that point. God is the greatest conceivable being. That's what he's saying. God is great. As the greatest conceivable being, God must be perfect, complete, flawless. If there were any imperfection in God, then he would not be the greatest conceivable being. Further, a perfect being must be a loving being. And we must understand what that love is. This is the case because love is a moral perfection. It's better for one to be loving rather than unloving. 
I think everybody here that understands what I'm saying would agree to that. Therefore, God must be a perfectly loving being. Now, it's the nature, this very nature of love, to give oneself away. It is the very nature of love to give oneself away. Love reaches out to another person rather than centering wholly in on one's self. Thus, if God is perfectly loving by His very nature, and He is, He must be giving Himself in love to another. But then that raises this question. Who is that other? It cannot be any created person. Why is that the case? Because creation is a result of God's free will, not a result of His nature. To admit a created person means God existed before there was the created person. It belongs to God's very essence to love, but it does not belong to His essence to create anything. That is, love did not demand that he create man. Now, we could spend a long time meditating on that and the implications of it. God is necessarily loving, and John just comes out and says it. God is love. But he's not necessarily creating. Jesus said, you can deny me, but I can't deny myself, which means he cannot deny what he is. God cannot deny God. Thus we can think of a possible world in which God is perfectly loving without any created persons existing. Therefore, created persons cannot be the sufficient explanation of whom God loves. But God is eternally loving. God is love. It therefore follows that the other to whom God's love is necessarily directed, are you listening? must be in, internal to God himself. Father loves the Son, Son loves the Father. Father and Son love the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit loves the Son and the Father. They are complete in the one divine essence. They are without need. God didn't need us, you know. He didn't need the church. There are no needs in God. God is sufficient as he is eternally. So in other words, God is not a single isolated person as Islam holds. Rather, God is a plurality of persons as the Bible doctrine of the Trinity holds. On the Islamic view, God is a person who does not give himself away essentially in love for another. He is focused essentially only on himself. Hence, he cannot be the most perfect thing or being. But the Bible teaches God is a Use another word here. Triad of persons in eternal, self-giving, love relationship. God, John, apostle of love, said, is love. Since God is essentially loving, then the doctrine of the Trinity is more plausible than any Unitarian doctrine of God such as Islam. Now, why is that the case? Because God is by nature a perfect, complete being of self-giving love. Now, if you haven't figured it out yet, right here is where you ought to quote John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The one singular divine essence composed of three persons gave the son. And for what purpose? To save us from the mess we got ourselves into. And nobody could get us out of but God. Do you see the selfless nature of love in God giving the greatest gift of which there's no greater to save us from our sins? Does that teach us anything about love? It ought to teach the Muslim about love and it ought to teach him about the nature of the true God because his God doesn't believe that. We will have a chance to bring that out more, Lord willing, this afternoon. And therefore, I want to, before we go into the second point, which will serve as our study this afternoon, end on this grand note, marvelous note, that God 
is love. That everything about the gospel said God loves you. And even though you have left him, though he did you no wrong, though you sinned against him, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 23, 23. He has even while we are yet sinners, sent his son to die for us. Who knew no sin? Who was tempted in every point like as we are, but he knew no sin. And when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we do that in memory of him. The greatest sacrifice of love and the example of love that ever could be. And yet man sits there full of guilt, full of misery, full of don't know what's going to happen next. And all that swells up in him, all because of the guilt of sin. He worries, doesn't know what's going to happen. He stumbles along in life. And there is in him the way that seemeth right unto him, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Everything in the whole created universe and then God's revelation in his word points him back to God whom he left by sin, by doing his own thing, by his pride, by his haughtiness, by doing as he pleases. And God still loves him. The gospel message still goes out to him from the members of the church who reflect that love in the spiritual house of God, the spiritual body of Christ. Surely the spiritual body of Christ of which we are members in particular should show forth the same kind of love that sent the only begotten Son of God into the world to be tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin and do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. And thus the church should be doing for the world what it's not even interested in in calling its attention back to God and Christ and the gospel. And that means we must expose error. And that which is contrary to God, the nature of God, the word of God, and all of its component parts. Now if you're not a child of God today, we beg of you to receive with meekness the engrafted, the implanted word which is able to save your soul. In so doing, be brought to belief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Repent of your sins and confess your faith in Him and be obedient to Him in being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. As a child of God, how are you living? Are you exemplary of one who is a member of the spiritual body of Christ that is to show forth God's love to a lost and dying world? If you committed sin, the second law of pardon is to repent of it from the heart. Confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness. And once again, walk the straight and narrow way of divine truth that leads from earth to heaven. If you're subject, then, to the invitation of Jesus, we bid you come while we stand and sing.